Ubiquity, the history of designs we take for granted. Created by Chris Whitwood. The car reshaped our world. Over the course of the 20th century, entire cities were transformed. New types of communities, shopping habits, working patterns and holidays emerged as our lifestyles changed to make way for the automobile. The motor car offered freedom to millions, but at a cost, both environmental and social, as urban environments were increasingly designed not for humans, but for machines. The mass adoption of motor cars that made all this possible only occurred thanks to cost savings generated by mass production. If one name can be synonymous with the development of the production line, it is that of Henry Ford. And no car is more closely associated with the process than the Ford Model T. Faster assembly meant cheaper labour costs per vehicle and therefore lower prices for the customer. By the time the one millionth Ford had rolled off the production line in 1915, Production time for the Model T had fallen from over 12 hours to only 93 minutes. However, this is not the story of the automobile, but of something far smaller, less noticeable, yet nonetheless significant. Look closely at a Model T, or indeed almost any car, and you will find, tucked out of sight or hidden under bits of trim, dozens, if not hundreds, of screws. As a method of fabrication, the screw is ideally suited to mass production. They can be quickly tightened using machines, and unlike nails or welds, they are relatively easy to remove without causing damage. The principle of the screw has been known for centuries. Their use for pumping water was described as early as 234 BC by the Greek mathematician, perhaps best known for the original Eureka moment, Archimedes. However, there is evidence that screws had existed in ancient Egypt well before this time. A screw is essentially a spiral plane around a solid core. The spiral creates a wedge, and as the screw turns, this wedge forces a substance, such as water or grain, upwards. Alternatively, in the case of a wine or oil press, the turn of a screw can be used to exert pressure. Yet it was not until the medieval period that screws for fabrication appeared, using that same force to hold two pieces of material together. These early screws were individually and painstakingly made, and as such were only found in high-value items, such as suits of armour or firearms. It would take the advent of industrialization before screws could be produced with precision at a rate that made them affordable for everyday use. A process for turning screws on a lathe was patented in 1760 by brothers Job and William Wyatt of Staffordshire. Over the next century, processes were improved to come up with the cold rolling method by which most screws are still produced today. Wire is passed through a straightening machine, cut to size and pressed to create screw blanks of the correct shape. These blanks are then rolled between dies at extremely high pressure which imprints the thread onto the screw. Despite progress in manufacturing during the 19th century, the head design for the overwhelming majority of screws had developed little. For the most part they either had a square or hexagonal head which was gripped from the outside or the head was recessed with a slot and turned with a flathead screwdriver. Peter Limburner Robertson was a salesman from Ontario. Travelling around the east coast of Canada, he would demonstrate a variety of products on street stalls and fairs. It was during one such demonstration, while extolling the virtues of a spring-powered screwdriver, that the flat-headed blade slipped and severely cut Robertson's hand. It was this incident that would lead him to develop his most successful invention. The Robertson screw used a square recess in the head of the screw rather than the conventional horizontal slot. This was not an entirely original idea. Square and triangular socketed screws had been designed before, but the process of using a die to stamp out the hole could deform or weaken the screw. To overcome this problem, instead of having a flat base to the hole in the screw head, Robertson tapered his recess to a point. This reduced the deformation and helped to align the grain of the metal. The design was a significant improvement, particularly in industry where even in the early 20th century mechanical screwdrivers were common. The square socket meant that unlike flathead screwdrivers, Robertson screws could easily be tightened with only one hand, and screwdrivers were less likely to slip, known as camming out, which could cause damage 
after the screw head or surrounding material. By 1913, Robertson's screws were becoming standard in the Canadian automotive industry. The Fisher Body Company, which made car bodies for Ford, and the Model T plant in Windsor, Ontario, accounted for a third of all sales. The construction of the Model T required around 700 screws, and using Robertson's design, rather than flathead screws, saved $2.60 per car. Henry Ford was interested. Negotiations began with a view to Ford licensing Robertson's screws for use in all of his car plants. However, Ford wanted a degree of control over production that Robertson was not willing to accept, and the deal fell through, losing Robertson his contract for the Canadian Ford plants. As a result, while Robertson screws remained popular in Canada, they failed to take off in other parts of the world. It would be another travelling salesman who would succeed where Robertson failed. In the early 1930s, Henry F. Phillips licensed a design by John P. Thompson, which used a cruciform cut in the head of the screw. Phillips established a company to market Thompson's screws, and over the following years, patented numerous refinements to the design. The screw head Phillips came up with was not just a simple cross. Like Robertson's design, the socket tapered to a point, providing strength, and the inside corners of the cross were rounded, which helped centre the screwdriver. This shape means crosshead screwdrivers can be used even if they're not a perfect fit, and at a push, a flathead screwdriver can also be used. Although Phillips screws are more prone to camming out than their Robertson counterparts, they were nevertheless a marked improvement on their flathead predecessors. The biggest difference between Robertson and Phillips was not in their screw design, but in their approach to business. Robertson, perhaps wary due to failed ventures in Europe, sought to keep control over the manufacturing process. Phillips' intention, by contrast, wasn't to make the screws himself, but to license his design to others and collect the royalties. He knew his market. In 1936, Phillips convinced General Motors to trial the screw on their Cadillac assembly line. General Motors were not the only ones who saw the benefit. Before long, the Phillips screw had been adopted across the automotive industry. Shipbuilders and aviation companies followed suit. The outbreak of the Second World War led to an increased demand in manufacturing. By reducing assembly time, use of the Phillips screw not only saved money, it also helped increase all-important military production. Exported to all fronts, the design went global, establishing a dominance over competitors which is yet to be surpassed. The crosshead screw is one of the most all-pervading designs in history. Almost all of us own a Phillips screwdriver of some sort, yet rarely, if ever, stop to consider its origin. Comparison to the Robertson screw is also a reminder that the products that are most common are not always those of the best design. There are many other factors that determine success, but when a product becomes as common as the crosshead screw, that universality works in its favour. New screw types have continued to come to market in recent years, yet Philips's design still dominates. After all, why would you buy a different type of screw if it meant you also needed to buy a different screwdriver? Questions such as this mean that once products achieve ubiquity, their dominance can be difficult to challenge, even if a better alternative exists. Thank you for listening to Ubiquity the history of designs we take for granted. Please like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. You can also follow the series on social media using the handle ubiquity underscore pod on Twitter and Instagram, or search Ubiquity Podcast on Facebook. All episodes will be available on YouTube. Please leave a like and a comment, as I'd love to hear your feedback and your ideas for future episodes. If you want to support the podcast financially, or just say thank you, please visit the Ubiquity Podcast Patreon at patreon.com forward slash ubiquity underscore pod. Patrons will also gain access to all of the scripts as episodes are released and will be able to vote on subjects for episodes in upcoming series. I hope you enjoyed this episode and thank you once again for listening.